a lot of great people in government are working to take care of our warriors, but there are a lot of problems. And we can't just get upset about those problems. We have to find solutions and, and go to Congress, go to the administration and say, take action. Here is something you can do to help our warriors and their families. Our ability to change legislation and push the VA and Department of Defense and Congress to support our warriors and their families uh, is, is one of our greatest legacies. Get up. Watch your eyes. Are you wet? Probably. It may to be though. Let's get you straightened out a little bit and then uh, go have breakfast. It's not Sunday, so don't ask for pancakes. <laughs> Is that, is that your rocket kick? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. Morning, Sparky. Morning. Yeah. Get stretched out. So just got extra air in it. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Probably. Oh, there it goes. way. I met Pam, uh, Jason was probably about two. It was a good age. Uh, you know, he was um, mobile and uh, very active and uh, he could be a handful, there's no doubt, but he was a good kid. All right, I got you Nick Muffin here. While he was in high school, 9-11 happened. And I think it had a really a profound impact. Yeah. About the same time, the recruiters start coming in, the military recruiters, and they start recruiting them when they're juniors mm -hmm. and very aggressive recruiters. Which we tried to sell them on the Air Force and the Navy, <laughs> um, but that didn't go over. He, he wanted an Army, and then it had to be infantry, and we're like, well, then that's it. We're done. He's going. He'll be in Iraq or Afghanistan. I joined the Army because of September 11th. And I felt I, I felt it was my job to um, do something for my country. My parents didn't want me to go in, but I just I, I did not take their thoughts into consideration, which was a mistake. I mean, not necessarily a mistake. I'm always gonna have those friends I'd made in the military, but um, I'm I'm always gonna have this too. The night before he was injured, he actually called home. And he and I talked for a while. They were going out early the next morning, transporting a bomb-sniffing dog to the polling station, because it was 
Baghdad's first elections. And I remember when I said, I really think you need to get off the phone because you have to get up so early. The next morning, we got the phone call. I remember the blast. Not too well, but I, I remember the blast right until I blacked out and nothing. It was the improvised explosive device. My sergeant died, Sergeant James Mowdy. I was the gunner. It uh, shot me at the top and um, shattered both my legs. And I got a, a brain injury. And lots of all these, they'll, they'll never heal. When we saw him the first time, it was, uh, it was pretty shocking. I can close my eyes and still see it. He was in a coma for about three months. We spent hours over there just sitting in his room or holding his hand or talking to him. I guess we thought uh, for the longest time that, you know, when he came out of it all, he was going to be Jason. And uh, turns out we didn't get Jason. We got something different. Um, that's, uh, I still find that is probably the hardest thing to deal with because he's not who he he's not who he was, and uh, he, we lost a lot. He lost a lot. He doesn't know it. Um, I don't think, uh, but but we see it, you know. And it's uh, I still feel helpless at times. Um, it's uh. I don't think I'll ever get over it. I'm not up to where I want to be. I want to get to back to 100%. And that's, that's a long road. But I'm, I'm working on it. Come on, come on, come on. Higher, higher. Good. Here we go. Come on, good, good. And there's the power. There's the power. Squeeze again. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You just crushed my team like that. You should be giving me a little bit more power than you were earlier. Come on. Squeeze. Good, good, good. There Jason go. was considered 100% disabled. Um, and the logical move for us would have been the Washington VA. They had prepared a room for Jason, and they gave us a tour of the facility, and we ended up in the uh, lunchroom. It was a bunch of uh, old, old guys, 75, 80-year-old guys in wheelchairs. We decided then that that was not what we were going to do for Jason. That wasn't what he needed to uh, get better. And so the only other option was for us to bring him home. He was the uh, most seriously wounded soldier in Maryland at the mm -hmm. time, and we brought him home. How do you feel about your workout? You feeling stronger these days? Or? I, I do. I really do. Well, what yeah. are some of the things you notice about yourself now? I feel like I can do a little bit more for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one of the things I've noticed, I noticed you've gotten a lot leaner. You know, how do you feel about your body these days? I feel like, good about it. I mean, you ain't no Vin Diesel or anything like that, but you know. <laughs> you know what? That was what called for. <laughs> because of Jason's work with Robert, he's much more physically able to do things that he wasn't before. And this is all from just an hour a day with somebody that knows what they're doing. The payoff is, is huge. Reach your feet every time you step, OK? Jason's been sitting in a wheelchair for seven years. But now, he walks around the basement with assistance from uh, Robert. I can help Jason walk around the basement. It's, it's pretty rewarding to, to see that. And Jason feels good about it. The thing that gets me about all that, he's having to pay for it. This is coming out of his pocket. And that kind of goes against the grain of the contract that Jason signed with the country. I mean, he's supposed to have uh, care for a lifetime. So I hear you're going to go talk to a congressman. What's going on with that? I think it's going to be pretty, pretty good. Yeah. I think um, my war needs to get out. So you're ready to tell your story, huh? I am. Okay. Well, you've been wanting to do something important with yes, your life and whatnot, been. so here's your opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a good it's a good opportunity for you to voice yourself and where you like to go, you know? Young man, family of your own, and place yeah, well, of your own. I really own. wouldn't mind that. Exactly. So let me hope you recognize those little peons when you get this all over with. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> Especially That's you. That's good. I appreciate that. I mean, you walk in and you doing your thing is, is enough for me. Mm -hmm. But you come a long way, you know. Over the past several years, I have been down to Capitol Hill doing advocacy for wounded soldiers and, and caregivers. And uh, I think it's important that um, Jason get down there because he's never been. I think it's important for uh, representatives to see Jason's story and how seriously wounded he was and where he's at now. And the second thing is for Jason to see these people that are making a difference for him. Those things mean something to him. We're in a city where history is made every day. 
DC can be an awe-inspiring setting. It can be intimidating, it can be overwhelming, and you have to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. Let me be clear, we are determined to make this the most successful, well-adjusted generation of veterans in our country's history. And to change lives, we often need to change legislation and change federal policy. This is a young organization, but it made its mark with a caregiver law that was precedent setting. And Mike and Pam have been in the trenches with us all the way through. It's important to us to evoke passion in legislators, and they have a compelling story. They live a heroic life. They've undertaken something really profound. We often deal with congressional staff, but getting a meeting of an hour's duration with a congressman is very unusual. So we want to make the most of this opportunity. What's really important about this traumatic brain injury law is that it redefines the concept of rehabilitation. And Mike and Pam advocate not just for themselves, they're advocating for families across the country. You must be Jason. I am. Very nice to meet you. So listen, we're gonna be meeting with Congressman Tim Walz. His career was in the Army, so he will be really interested in, you know, really hearing your story. And fundamentally, how, uh, how is this law working or not working? So what we're hoping for with the uh, long-term TBI care is that are rehabilitative care is that there are rehabilitative services that are gonna continue uh, and be provided to, to uh, people like Jason to help them get better. When Jason first uh, came home, he was going through um, probably two to three different types of therapy a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. And his doctor was telling us that they're going to tell you that he'll stop making progress after two years because that's textbook. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, probably around the two-year mark, the finance office was saying, well, how much longer? Because it's been two years, you know, and he was still making progress, which was surprising to me why they stopped. So basically a, a service that should be covered under this law mm -hmm. is a service you're providing out of pocket. That's right. what I'm hearing. Correct, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really disturbing. And I think those are important points to bring up to the congressman because Mr. Waltz is a member of an oversight committee as a member of a Veterans, <laughs> Veterans Affairs Committee and this law is very much about directing VA to put the book aside and make the veteran and the family the centerpiece. Yeah. So Jason, you've made a lot of progress already, yeah, but I, but I, I suppose I have. Yeah. So when you were told you had plateaued, what what did I that? Want, I don't want to hear, I don't listen to that. No. Mm. Well, I don't blame you. I mean, what kind of guy wants to hear they plateaued? Not me. Absolutely. Well, and and you have aspirations yes, to, to keep to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should. Getting Jason down to D.C. is a good thing. He is very patriotic. And just seeing the buildings, just seeing the Capitol, seeing the White House, I think it's going to close the loop for him. You know, that what he did was meaningful. It wasn't for nothing. If there's any lesson that comes from watching the struggle of these wounded warriors come back, it's this. This country needs to be a little bit stingier when it comes to committing our men and women to battle. The cost now is not just in the lives lost, it's in the lives changed forever. The Wounded Warrior Project is very committed to talking with our warriors and seeing what are the barriers, why are they facing these challenges, and going to lawmakers and sharing those stories uh, to let them know, you know, where changes need to be made. We're not doing as good a job as we need to. And when you're in a bureaucracy, it is slow moving sometimes. But when it comes to veterans, there's not Republicans and Democrats and independents. Uh, generally, it's just people working really hard to get the job done. So it's a powerful thing. You know, if you can get Republicans and Democrats agreeing, asking for information, demanding that a better job be done, you know, that's the way to move things forward. I don't want Jason to ever feel that what he went through was for nothing. He did not waste his life for that one year that he spent in the military. Well, thanks for being here, Jason. No problem. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your service. And, sure thing. Uh, and your parent service. Um, I wanted to, uh, to hear the story. So, Jason, what are some of the things you'd like to do that you can't do now? I just want to do more for myself, you know? Yeah, independence. Yes. 
I'm sick of everybody having to do this stuff for me. Yes. At this point in time, Jason's still making progress in his therapy. You know, they started him out with occupational therapy, cognitive therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, and the VA was paying for all of that. But one by one, they've dropped off. Now, we can't stop and wait for the VA because he'll regress. So everything we're doing, we're paying for. Wow. For this very same circumstance was why that law was written. I think you go so far up into the VA, and then you hit a brick wall, and then it's like, that's not how we do it, or we use, yeah. this is the way we do things here, and Congress's intent was that if the potential was there and the challenges were there to try and bring back Jason mm -hmm. and every one of our warriors to their fullest potential, we wanted to make that available. Was mm -hmm. the book said, this is what they should be able to do. Can they get to a get wheelchair? A yeah, get it higher. If, if he chooses it sometime, I, w I want to learn to, uh, to adapt and, and, and use a snowboard more. or... Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. Yeah, see, they, if, if, if any of the... skis. Yeah, or skis. And the research coming out of the civilian sector side of this shows that what we used to think was the ceiling or the plateau that couldn't be breached is not true, and that the individual circumstances dominate that. So if Jason wants to do these things, then we need to make them available and continue to push that limit of what he's capable of doing. That was our intent. My goal is for him to be back the way he was before. You That's know, right. And I don't want to stop until he gets That's there. Right. Now, he may never get there, but then we're not going to stop. Oh, I am absolute agreement on that. And it's not callousness, maliciousness, mm -hmm. or anything out of the VA. I think it becomes more that you get locked into what right. the book says instead of with warriors like Jason. We don't know what the limit is. Right. Because this is a pushing the envelope. And we, we clearly knew that when we wrote the law. The reason we wrote the law was because we didn't feel they were pushing the envelope. Right. And so I'm the VA's biggest supporter, but I will also be their harshest critic when the time comes. That's the way it is. And in listening to you, I am not satisfied that the way that we wrote the law and that I intended it to be carried out is happening. And it's my responsibility to go back and provide the oversight, correct it, and continue to, to do that, that monitoring. Because that commitment to raise your hand, go and serve, is a binding lifetime mm -hmm. contract. It would have been easier for you to deal with your own challenges of having a wounded warrior and be private about it, but your choice to come forward with it will make a difference. Uh, it does make a difference. That's why this is critical to get this right. Probably four months after Jason's injuries. The doctors were preparing us for um, how he might come out of the coma. They explained that typically it's with aggression, a lot of anger. And so one weekend, my two sisters were in the hospital with me, and we were just reminiscing and laughing and carrying on in his room. Jason came out of the coma laughing. He just started laughing at the jokes. Jason is a perfect example of not following the textbook. Everything he's done, at the point he's done it, every one of his therapists and doctors were surprised. There's a small group of people that really know where we started. Mm -hmm. It's a vegetable. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at Jason now, he's, he's gotten much better. Mm -hmm. And um, it's due to people. It's getting out of the hospital and getting back into the community. I think he wants to be treated that way. I think he wants to feel like he's no different than anybody else. Now when we take him out, it's, I don't think about it. You just wheel him out and we go. The doctor has told us every time he's seen us, he doesn't think Jason would have made it as far as he has if he had been institutionalized. My parents fight for me, tooth and nail. I don't know where I'd be without them. I don't think I could do it. Do my like my parents do for me. They make it look easy. I, I know it's not. And I love them every day for that. I'm really worried about what's going to happen when mom and dad can't take care of Jason. The answer is to prepare Jason the best that you can. He needs more therapy. He needs to continue to improve and become more independent. So the more he can do on his own, the better off he's going to be. When that time comes and he's going to be on his own. I would more than anything want to get out of the chair and just walk around again. And I think everybody wants a family. It might be hard for me, but I love people. So I'm sure I can get it done. 
It's up to me whether I think I plateaued or not. Not anybody else. This is my world. <laughs>